Praise God for his beauty, his goodness, and his grace. Are you thankful today that you know the Lord? I mean, I know you are, so I'm just, I'm, I'm grateful with you. I'm, I, I stand with you today under the grace of God, the banner of grace. God's a good God, and we're, we're blessed to be able to know him. Today we are concluding the four-part series that we've been involved in called Generous, and uh, I want to talk to you today from this subject or title, Blessed, Blessed to Be a Blessing, Blessed to Be a Blessing. A blessing. It's an important subject, extremely important. I believe if you can grasp, grasp the Word of God as it deals with this, I promise you that every one of you will be benefited by it. If you'll apply it to your life, I promise you that uh, if you'll do that, God's grace will re- rest on you uh, emotionally, physically, mentally, uh, and every, everything, spiritual health, the goodness of God. And so I just challenge you to, to dig in and dig deep as we conclude the service today. Soren Kierkegaard told a story about a town where ducks live, only ducks, Duckville. And every Sunday morning, all the ducks would waddle out of their duck housing down Main Street and up to the duck church, and they would, they would wiggle their way up onto the duck seat, and they would sing duck songs and worship, and uh, the duck choir would waddle its way out and lead in some duck uh, choir numbers, and then the duck preacher would come. And this particular Sunday, he read the text, you shall mount up with wings like eagles. You shall mount up with wings like eagles. And he began to preach. And he said, ducks, I've come to tell you today that you can fly like an eagle. No pen, no fence, no wall can ever contain you. God made you with wings, ducks, and you can fly like the eagles. And all the ducks said, amen, duck preacher. And then they slipped off their duck seats and waddled their way out of their church and waddled all the way home. Some of you are going to get that after a while. (laughs) I believe that you've heard the message of generosity. I believe you've received the message of generosity. I believe that you were already generous before we did a series on generosity every week. We have faithful servants, leaders, people contributing with their time, their treasure, their talents, their gifts, and serving others in their lives. And unlike the ducks who said amen to yes, we can fly and then waddled home, I believe we said yes to God's generous heart toward us, and then we are walking out of here to live more generous lives. That's the bottom line, ultimately, is to live more generous lives. I want to go back to God's covenant with Abraham, all the way back to Genesis 12. And this is the text where God said to Abraham in Genesis 12 and 1, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Now, I want you to help me uh, say these underlined and bolded statements. Are you ready? I will bless you. Come on, everybody. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless you, and you shall be a blessing. God's covenant with Abraham included those two factors, that God was going to bless Abraham, and then in turn, Abraham would bless others. So when the children of Israel were in captivity, you remember in Egyptian bondage for four hundred years and they were beating them with whips and making them as serving them as slaves and stinging them with scorpions and doing everything imaginable and repressing the people of God. And God said to Moses, to Pharaoh through Moses, I want my people delivered. I want to let my people go. And ultimately the plagues, plagues came and the Passover came, the death angel came And then the Red Sea parted and the wilderness provision, all this, why? God did all that. Why did God do that? It's because God wanted heathen nations to see his blessing and his goodness in the lives of his people Israel and say, man, we need to be on Jehovah's team. He wanted their hearts to turn to him and serve him instead What happened was Israel got uh, ingrown, greedy, graspy, self-absorbed, and the beauty that God had intended for Israel to become as a nation uh, then sort of went out the window, and they didn't arrive at the place where God desired for them to live. They, they uh, They never were elevated to the place where God had originally intended for them to be as a 
people. The problem was not God's blessing. The problem was with the children of Israel. Their unbelievable selfishness and ingratitude caused them to begin to murmur and complain and to chase after other gods of heathen nations. And so instead of being the special, beautiful nation God blessed them and intended them to be, they, they, they were allowing, um, they allowed their greedy selfishness and ungratefulness to dull their identity and the beauty that God originally intended. Think about some of the great stories that we love in the Bible. The story of David and Goliath, and this shepherd boy faces this huge giant of the Philistines, and God uses David and empowers David to topple the Goliath, the, 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 the giant of Goliath. And the, and the, the purpose was that, that all the Philistines and the other nations, the heathens around them, would hear what God did for Israel. They used this little boy to take down the champion of the Philistines, and that they, they would look to Jehovah, and they would turn their hearts to God. Think about Daniel and lion's den. Why did that story happen? Well, Daniel goes in, he prays three times a day, he never sh shuts it down. He winds up in the den of lions, hungry lions, by the way, and not a paw or a tooth landed on him. God shut the mouth of the lions. And you say, well, why, why did that happen? Well, Darius the king said why it happened. The, so that the nations of the world would bow down to the God of Daniel. That's why it happened. You work your way through the Old Testament, you find God's blessing his people over and over again, but for a reason, so that they can in turn be a blessing to others. As believers, we're called to be channels of God's blessing, conduits through which the blessing of God flows, highways of his grace and goodness, that, that, that we, we ought to be people whose lives are marked by generosity, who, who just pass the blessing along. I've, I've said it from this pulpit many times, I, 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 it's, it's, I'll be redundant, okay? It, it, the Lord didn't make us to be pools with only inlets. We are, if that's you today, I would just challenge you, get you a sharpshooter, a spade, a shovel, an a ax or something, and cut some outlets into your pool. Because if we only have inlets and no outlets, then we just have stuff coming in, goodness coming in, but it never, never leaves out. We become befouled and scum laden and putrefied. The swans don't swim any longer on our pond of life. And the birds don't bathe in the water there because it's putrefied. We need inlets, but we also need outlets in our lives or else we ruin what God has sought to bless us with. When God is abundantly generous with us, he does that with the intent that we're going to pass it along to others. So the Abrahamic covenant is this. The top line equals blessing. In other words, God said, I will bless you and I will make your name great. Well, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is then responsibility. The top line is blessing. I'll bless you, make your name great. And then God says, but you shall be a blessing in turn. So we have a responsibility having received the blessing of God to then respond in generosity. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So this, this covenant is for the church today. I'm talking to us about present-day Christians. Just as God had a covenant with the children of Israel, he has, the, he has a covenant with us as his children. Luke 22 and 20, Jesus is celebrating the Last Supper with his disciples, and they're gathered in the upper room uh, to celebrate this time. This is just before Gethsemane, just before the trial, just before Jesus was beaten within an inch of his life and then finally crucified. Luke 22 and 20, after supper, he took another cup. Jesus took another cup of wine and said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Something special happened in that moment. With the taking of the bread and the cup at the last supper, God initiated a new covenant. Everybody say new covenant. God initiated a new covenant or a new agreement with his people. Now listen, folks, if I stopped right now and said, if you want the blessing of God on you, if you want God to bless you, uh, you want blessings from the Lord, I want you to raise your hand. Every hand in the room, obviously, would go up. I mean, we want God to bless us relationally. We want our relationships to flourish. We want God to bless us physically. We want to be healthy and strong. We want God to bless us with protection. We want our kids and grandkids safe and sane in a crazy, chaotic wild world. We, we want God to bless us uh, in our resources. We want promotions on our job. We want to climb the ladder. We want to see God's hand in our lives. We want to see God bless us financially and, and physically and emotionally. 
And God wants to do that, but let me tell you something. You and I are responsible to take what God has already given us and become a conduit of blessing to others around us. Luke chapter 6, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in that chapter, Jesus lays out all kinds of blessings, blessings that we can receive and blessings that we should receive, but blessings that are determined by our attitude. That may be why they're called the B attitudes, the Beatitudes. He addresses our attitudes toward our circumstances in Luke 6, verses 20 through 26. Our attitude toward other people, verses 27 through 38. Our attitudes toward ourselves, verses 39 through 45. Our attitude toward God, verses 46 through 49 of Luke chapter 6. We only got time to look at one of those today. So I want us to look at our attitude toward other people. It's interesting that Jesus starts his teaching in this the, the thing. He says this in verse 27, but I say to you who hear, but I say to you who hear. In other words, it doesn't seem like everybody's going to hear because Jesus said, look, if you got your ears on, come in, breaker, breaker, one, nine, you got your ears on there, good buddy. None of y'all are old enough to remember that. I just dated myself by about 40 years. I got a little worm sitting on the front row. I'm night crawler over here, and that's our CB handles back in the day. Uh, the Lord says, if you, if, you, if you have ears to hear, I want to talk to those of you who have ears to hear. So the first principle that Jesus teaches us is that we have to realize that some will obey and others will not obey. Some are going to hear and respond, and others will hear and not respond. And you know, as much as I want every one of you to grab hold of this principle, Jesus makes it clear that some will hear and obey and others will not. I've been amazed. I've been amazed over the years to watch people leave the same service and one person leave uh, just elated in their spirit, lifted up, and they receive something maybe through the worship time or through the altar time or through a prayer that was prayed or maybe through the message and they're leaving out of the room and God's doing a new work, a fresh work in their heart and they're making some course corrections and they're tweaking their life a little bit with some decisions they're making about their future and, and they're, they're leaving uh, having received from the Lord and then there is somebody else right behind them on the way out who received nothing from the service. They're thinking, they leave thinking, man, that worship, Puh. I, Let me just pause here and say, what an amazing team of worship leaders and production team and people getting the words on the screen at the right time and making sure that Facebook Live's got the stream, making sure the Russell campus has got this. I want to tell you, if you ever go up in that 747 cockpit up there, it is chaotic up there and you can't go up there unless you've got nerves of steel because things are happening that quick, get, making sure that the stream is getting out. We got an t- amazing team of people to help us put on a Sunday morning service just right here in this room, not counting all the people who are serving us every week, not just today, especially today, but every week people serving us in this body. Then there are people that, that, that have left on a spiritual high. Then there's somebody behind them that says, man, the worship was terrible. Or man, Pastor Tom, he could not get his thinking cap on today. What was the matter with that message? Same worship service, same preacher, same message. What happened? See, receiving and and passing on the blessing is your choice, not mine. I'm responsible to teach and preach what this book says, the unchanging, undying truth of God's Word. But it's your responsibility, responsibility to hear and receive the truth of God's Word. Jesus said, to those of you who are listening, some of you walk out of here and become incredible recipients of the blessing of God, and others of you will leave here and go through the rest of your life wondering, why does my life look like this and her life look like that? I don't understand it. It doesn't seem fair. So the first principle is not everybody's going to hear and obey. The second principle that Jesus teaches in this passage is that you're to treat others as you want to be treated. Instead of putting others in their place, put yourself in their place once in a while. We know it's the golden rule right there in verse 27 of Luke 6. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. I'm just going to stop right there and say this. Do you want to be blessed? 
Listen, the Lord said, I got all kinds of blessings for you. I can bless you physically. I can bless you emotionally, relationally, spiritually, financially. I'm ready to pour out the blessing of this covenant on you. But if you want to receive, just do one thing, one simple thing for me. If you want to receive all my blessings, the Lord would say, do one thing. Hey, love your enemies. What? Love my enemies? That, that, Pastor Tom, that must be, it must mean something else in the Greek. I wish you'd dig it out and get the, get, find out what the Greek says about that because I know he can't be taught. He must not know my enemies. We can stop right here and dismiss the service because many of us absolutely do not walk the high road at all in this area. As a matter of fact, some of us are bottom dwellers. We're going through life with a grudge, mad and wanting to get even and just hoping for the day when, we can, when they have to writhe in their disappointment or their pain because that's what they did to us. I hope I'm right there to see it, maybe even participate in it. Somebody did me wrong and it's a splinter in my spirit and you don't have to talk to me about 30 seconds and you know I'm carrying something like that in my life. It's a spiritual infection. You're not speaking to somebody. You've got walls and barricades built. There are obstructions in your life that you need to knock down so that you can be forgiven, first of all, and then that the blessings of heaven can flow into your life. You box God out. You want the blessing of God, but you don't want to do what he commanded you to do. Look at this. Luke 6, 28. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Hey, try that in the Walmart parking lot, huh? I mean, really, you do that stuff? I, I just give you, I just say this to you. Don't leave your Sunday morning experience and go to Walmart. It'll suck all, suck all the victory that you might have got today in your life right out. Like a big suction. Well, God, my boss is a real jerk. He's unbearable to work for. But Lord, would you just please bless him, Lord. Bless him, bless him. Yeah, hey, Lord, here's a good idea. Bless him with a brick. I, Some of you are saying, that stuff's not possible. Oh, yes, it is. Quit rationalizing your way out of it. Quit excusing yourself. Jesus isn't going to tell you to do something that you're unable to do. And I'll tell you what, if you're not living by this standard, it has nothing to do with you not being able to do it. It has everything to do with you not be sub being submitted enough to do it. So the blessings of heaven come when we're submitted to the Word of God over our lives. When Jesus is Lord and not my emotions. When my, my emotions are not ruling the day. No, I'm submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And the Lord said, pray for them. Love them. Bless them. See, you, you, you can't live the low road, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You can't, you, 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 you can't jerk somebody around that just jerked you around. Tell somebody off that told you off. Honk at somebody. Scream at somebody. You got a big Christchurch dove sticker on the back of your window. Uh, you got your arm way out, waving out the window. Get out of the road. Drive it or park it and build a fence around it. At that point, I think it morphs, that dove morphs into canary or maybe even a, a crow. I think maybe even more crows. Some of you may need a sticker. Some of you may need a sticker. It helps me sometimes. I'm driving by. I'm thinking, man, I want to lay down on this, but I think, oh, I better, I better not. Better not honk at that person. I got a sticker on the back of my car. They're going to know I go to Christ's church. See, there's nothing wrong with a little deterrent, but we do that stuff. And we wonder why God doesn't bless us. Why our relationships aren't healthy? Why that every time we get around family, there's a clash and we, we, we don't take the low road. We, we, we take the low road every time over the high road. And we wonder why we can't seem to get any traction in life. Make the choice that you're not going to live like the rest of the world. It is a choice of your will. I don't have any enemies. I'm guessing I can have some people who don't like me, but that's their problem. Now, listen, I love everybody. I go through life loving everybody that will let me love them. And I, I'm loving and patting and hugging and, and lifting people as much as I can. Listen, if I've hugged you and you got something against me, I apologize. I didn't know it. I don't have enemies. Maybe there's some people that consider me that I might be their enemy, but they're not my enemy. 
I mean, it'd be foolish for me to try to live my life for the Lord and position myself to live under the blessing of the Lord and allow their incredibly rotten, caustic, ugly, stinking attitude to affect the way I'm going to live my life. Ain't going to happen. I'm going to rise above the junk. I'm going to rise up in the high road and take the high road and be a blessing in people's life regardless of what they think about me. I'm going to do it because I've been blessed and I'm going to be a conduit through which the blessings of God flow. I don't care who gets them. I'm just going to be a conduit. So let it splash out on you in the meantime. Amen. Sometimes... We just have to do the next right thing. Some of you in horrible relationships, you've, been, you've had horrible relationships in the past, and maybe it's time for you to give up and move on. It's time for you to move on to another day and have a new thought, one that's positive, good, healthy, and healing. God says, I want to bless you, but you've got to live the high road life. So number one, you've got to realize that some will obey and others will not. Number two, treat others as you want to be treated. Number three, learn to give for the right reasons. He gives us some insight here. The wrong reason to give is because somebody has given to you. Luke 6, 32 and 33, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. I mean, really. People who have no affinity, no connection to the name of Jesus Christ. They, they, I mean, they, you do good to me, I'll do good to you. In other words, don't say they smile at me, so I smile at them. They were nice to me, so I was nice to them. Or they complimented me, so I complimented me. Come on, that's, that's junior high stuff, isn't it? I mean, aren't we moving beyond that in the kingdom of God? Even people who don't love God do that kind of stuff. If you just return something nice, that's no big deal. Sinners do that. Don't you love those people who say, you know, I, I think you bought lunch, you paid for lunch back, I think it was like in 13, 2013, I remember like $7.46, I'm going to buy lunch. I mean, do you like those people who keep score like that? I don't really like to keep score like that. I mean, like, do you get migraines trying to remember who you're supposed to be mad at, whom I'm not speaking to, who I'm dodging at church or dodging at Walmart or dodging the cleaners or dodging the car wash. It'll act like you, you're absorbed in the magazine and you get that thing all the way up here so you don't have to make eye contact with that person. Your best day all week long is when you don't have to run into them. I mean, that, that listen, we got to move beyond that lifestyle and that kind of, what a miserable way to live. So here are the right reasons to give because it's what God expects. I mean, when you think about all that God has done for us, there is an expectation of a reciprocal response in our lives. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That God would do that for us. That Jesus would go to the cross and bear your sin debt and pay my sin debt. That seems like there ought to be a reciprocal response, right? I mean, I think we all understand that. So it's what God expects. And then the right reason to give is it's what God has modeled. Luke 6, 35. I tell you, love your enemies. Help and give without expecting a return. You'll never, I promise, regret it. Live out this God-created identity the way your Father, our Father in heaven, lives toward us generously and graciously. Even when we're at our worst, our Father is kind. You be kind. You be kind. He says some people live only for, pre for present value. All they live for is what they're going to receive. So they only give if they think they're going to get it back real quick. And then there are other people who live, they, have a, 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 they live for future value. They live not only for themselves, but for what is beyond their lives. They believe they have a responsibility, according to God's blessing in their own lives, to give. Not because they'll receive something from it, but simply because they have been blessed. And some people live for another kind of value that a lot of folks just never connect the dots. They don't get this. A lot of people live for a value that is eternal in nature. Things that will live beyond themselves. When they're dead and gone, it just keeps on giving, keeps on giving. 
for only God to recognize. See, you don't give to get, you give because it's what God expects, it's what God has modeled. Here's the third thing. You give because you understand what you sow, you will also reap. Understand how life's principles work. What you put into it is what you get out of it. You're never going to plant cantaloupe. You're never going to plant cantaloupe and harvest corn. Does not work that way. So when you're getting what you don't want to get out of your life, don't go around wondering why. He says why. It's because you're planting the wrong stuff. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. See, Jesus said, don't judge others, and you won't be judged. Don't be hard on others. God won't be hard on you. Don't you understand how life works? If you're critical toward others, guess how others will be toward you? Critical. If you're a fault finder, people are always going to be finding fault with you. If you sit out there with a great gift of music and worship and a voice that makes sounds like the angels, but you sit there and nitpick people here trying to lead worship, you'll never have the boldness to get up here and lead worship because you're going to think people are sitting out there doing to you what you've been doing to them all your life. You get what you give in life. It's not really that complicated. So Jesus gives us a few principles. He says, if you'll live by these principles, I've got wonderful blessings for you. It's not an unachievable life. It's just one that requires willful obedience. Now look at what he says next. Forgive and you will be forgiven. So if you're having a hard time forgiving others, you might want to talk to God about it a little bit because he may just kind of decide to withhold forgiveness from you until you're willing to forgive somebody else. Luke 6, 38, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. See, there's a whole bunch of blessing right there in that scripture. The way you treat others is the way you will be treated. John Maxwell would not be a name that most of us wouldn't recognize. He, he quoted two separate health studies that were, were conducted, one from the University of Missouri and the other from the Institute of Health in New York City. Listen to this. The University of Missouri found that people who lived the longest were those who helped others and enjoyed interpersonal relationships. They were helpers. They had friends. The study in New York found that people who helped get what they call a helper's high, that endorphins are released as they're helping others and it elevates them emotionally. And they reported better health and an improved sense of well-being in their life. Now, that's not the Bible. That's not Sunday morning church. That's not even your small group study. That's a bunch of medical professionals asking each other, why did that man live longer than that man? Why does one person seem to have good mental health and the other doesn't? And they concluded that people with good mental health are givers and people with bad mental health are takers, the people who have ulcers and stress and anxiety go through life wondering if somebody's got something they don't have, conniving, trying to figure out how they can get it. Isn't it amazing that the scientific community finally finds out what Jesus has been telling us for 2,000 years? You ought to make the choice today, I'm going to punctuate my life with generosity. I'm going to be a generous person. I'm, I'm not talking solely about finance. Certainly finance is included in that, but that, that could be the, one of the least important issues. I'm talking about forgiveness. I'm, I'm talking about giving away some of your time. Maybe, maybe just to listen to somebody. Maybe somebody doesn't have anybody to talk to. Maybe it's a senior. You just pull up a chair and listen and pour out their heart for 15 minutes. Maybe it's just bringing a young lady under your arm, you, you mothers in the church, and just love her and teach her and mentor her. She doesn't have a godly home. She doesn't have a godly mother. Maybe her mother's an addict, but she got a mother in the church that's teaching her how to live a godly life as a young woman and how her future can be shaped and changed because of the influence of Christ in her life. Or maybe it's a, a young man that you put your arm around his shoulder and say, listen, son, I want to teach you respect. I want to teach you how to respect authority in your life. I want to teach you how to respect Jesus. 
and to fall in love with the Lord and show you how your life will be changed. Maybe that's what it is for us. Listen, stop hoarding and start giving. Live with an open heart and an open hand. Quit wondering why you have no fulfillment in life. It's been said from this pulpit many times, the best way to love God is to love one another. The best way to serve God is to serve one another. You are blessed to be a blessing. Let me close with this. It's a little legend about a man known only as Martin of Tours said to be the first military chaplain. He followed the Roman army around from, from uh, city to city as they conquered cities. And he ministered to the military and he ministered to those who lived in places that were conquered by the Roman army. One cold winter day, he was following the Roman army into a city and there was a beggar sitting at the gates of the city. When Martin had been traveling for two weeks, he had neither coin nor crusts of bread. And the man asked for alms, and Martin of Tours, standing there with nothing to give, had only to his name a filthy Roman overcoat. So he took the overcoat off and laid it on the ground, and with his sword, he hacked it right down the middle in two pieces. He took the piece and laid it over the beggar's shoulders and went on his way with half the coat for himself. Late that night, as he lay shivering in the cold, trying to rest, he had a vision. And he saw the scene playing out in heaven. And there he saw the Lord with the angels gathered around him. And he looked closer and he realized that the Lord Jesus has a filthy half coat on. And the angels fluttering around said, Lord, you're so great and majestic. Why, why do you have this half a filthy Roman coat on your back? And in the soft silence, as the angels stilled their wings and waited for the Lord's response, Martin heard Jesus say, my good servant Martin gave it to me. My good servant, Martin, gave it to me. You know what's beautiful about short-term missions trips is that we get out of our comfort zone and go to a land where they have nothing, and we bring a few of these little toys that our kids and grandkids get at McDonald's and Burger King and Chick-fil-A, and we gather them up out of the back seat of the car or the floorboard or out of the toy box and send that down there. And we got a few ball caps that we got while we were, you know, playing sports and we throw those used ball caps in the bag and take those down there and a few old t-shirts that maybe say I love my church Christ church we send those down there and as people think man it is Christmas in July maybe a bottle of ibuprofen to help with the toothache or some emodium to help with stomach problems and they think heaven has come down what's beautiful about that is that it gives us an opportunity to demonstrate the generosity of heaven in our lives and we see what a blessing just a simple gesture of kindness is to someone in desperate need. It does us good. I've said it for years. I've taught our team. I've taught anybody who will listen to me really, our serve team, that when you're standing at these doors or greeting in the lobby or greeting at the doors or even moving in and out of this worship center before and after church and you're bumping into people always be willing to embrace somebody always be willing to demonstrate the love of Christ to somebody because you never know for some people all week long all they've received from people they love is put downs cursings reasons why I'm withdrawing my love from you these Kids of yours are in my way. I don't know why in the world I ever said I'd take them anyway. And they come in here broken all week long. They've had nothing but put down and accusation and innuendo. And when they get in their car and head to church on Sunday morning, something begins to rise. Some, something, hope begins to build in their lives. Because they know when they walk in that door, somebody's going to high-five them with a big broad smile and say, man, I'm so glad. To, I'm so glad to see you today, man. God's got something for you. 
I know you're going to be blessed today. Thank you for being here. We love you here. Just a simple gesture. You don't have to go to Honduras or across the pond somewhere to find a place to give back and to be generous. As a matter of fact, I believe that today, if your prayer would simply be, Lord, give me, give me an opportunity to demonstrate your love and generosity to somebody, I believe before this day's out, you're going to have a divine intersection. If you pray that from your heart, God will put somebody in your path that needs a kind word, a gentle lift. Maybe it is 20 bucks. Maybe it's nothing like that at all. Maybe it's just a pat on the back, a, a hug around the neck, and let somebody know that, hey, there are people in this world, in this big, crazy, chaotic world in which we're living, there are people in this world that love you and care about your eternal destiny. You pray, God, use me today, you'll have a divine intersection. God will make sure that you don't close your day out without somebody being in your path that you can be a blessing to. And somebody said, I used to complain about my shoes until I saw the man with no feet. See, it's all relative, isn't it? I mean, right where you are, you were designed to be a blessing. Your hands, your mouth, your words, your ears, your eyes can be a blessing if you'll as Jesus said, if you have ears to hear what I'm about to say, listen up because I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Generosity. Lord, make us generous in Jesus' name. Come on, you receive the word of the Lord this morning. Put your hands together. Just before we're dismissed, I don't like to dismiss any service without giving somebody in this room an opportunity just to make sure, just to make sure that you're ready to, to meet the Lord. And you think about all that God has done for us, the travesty would be to come to a service like this week in and week out, month in and month out, maybe year in and year out, and hear the message about the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's generous heart toward us in that Christ would die for full and satisfactory payment of our own sins. And then kind of just turn a deaf ear to that. To look into the Word of God, it becomes a mirror to us. And then to see ourselves and, and say, you know, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to do something about my condition, my spiritual condition. And then see ourselves as we are and know that we need to make a change for the good and allow Christ to shape our lives and walk out and forget what we saw in the mirror happens every week that the Word of God pricks a heart and somebody would say, well, you know what, we're, man, it's, it's like three minutes before we're supposed to be out of here. I got, and they got the pork, I got, I got chicken fried steak waiting on me down at Grandy's down there. I got to hurry up and get, I, I, you know, I'll do it. I'll, Lord, I'll do it next time. Well, for some people, frankly, next time just never shows up. Next time never comes around. So just want to, while you're looking right here, everybody's attention focused right here, I want to ask you the question, are you ready for eternity? Are you ready to meet God? Have you given your life to Jesus? Or are you just kind of going with the flow, playing a few games and thinking, sometime later, I'll get around to that. Well, tomorrow may never come. For thousands of people today, living and breathing today, tomorrow will not arrive. They're going to go out into their eternity. Some of them knowing the Lord, some of them never making any overture toward Christ. I don't want that to be anybody in this room. So with your heads bowed, honoring the presence of the Lord. Maybe you've known the Lord, maybe you've committed your life to Christ, but you're cold in your relationship with God. You're in a backslidden condition. You know it, God knows it. You're the first one to know that. Or maybe you've been to church, and maybe you've sing the songs, maybe you do the church thing, maybe you're even in a small group. But you know in your heart of hearts, you've never been faithful to say to Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me, Lord. I believe that what you did is enough for me. Are you here this morning 
and that describes you, either of those appeals, would you just boldly raise your hand across this room right now? Come on. Oh, thank you. There's, there's a dozen hands up in this room right now. Thank you. You put your hands down. Thank you so much. This is what I want us to do. I want us to pray together. Not just those of you who raise your hand, but everybody in the room. I want us to pray full voice. From your heart now, I want you to pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I commit myself completely to you. All that I am, all that I ever hope to become, I lay it at your feet. Take my life. Cleanse me. Make me a new creation. Give me a fresh faith. I will serve you, Lord, for as long as I live. I give my life to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, put your hands together. Let's thank God for what just happened in this room.